you know, oh, just speaking up um, and sharing your thoughts. And um, here we go. This is how we've been doing it. Okay. So, hi. This is more my jam. Here we go. So um, this is, like I said, the story of Chana. Um, and um, sorry, I'm just getting one quick text. Um, okay. <laughs> um, that this is, uh, so, um, okay. Here's the story of Chana. This is how the entire book of Shmuel opens. Um, would, now, in the English, one fun thing is that the, the, the verse numbers don't translate. So um, because it's a little difficult to call on different people to read, I'm going to read and then ask questions. And please answer them, or else you're going to get really sick of listening to me talk. So the very, the first introduction, the two introductory verses, is there was a man from Ramatayim of the Zufites in the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, son of, okay, Alihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and Ephraimite. He had two wives, one named Chana and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Chana was childless. So already, how are we setting up the story initially? Of course, this is the story of Chana. How are we setting up her story? Who is her foil? Elkanah. Right, Elkanah is her husband, right? And... Oh, and Penina. The one, what? Penina. 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 Penina, right. And Penina is the one who has, and Hannah doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So that's our first thing. Now, this man, meaning Elkanah, used to, was, used to go up from his town every year to worship and to offer sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. Chafni and Pinchas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord there. One such day, Elkanah offered a sacrifice. He used to give portions to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Chana, he would give one portion only, though Chana was his favorite, for the Lord had closed her womb. So now we are told initially the objective reality, right? Chana does not have children, but Penina does. Now this is influencing the way she is treated, because how is she treated in comparison to her sister wife? She gets less. She gets less, right? Exactly. So her story is progressing the way we would envision it to, and we're, we're starting you know, to feel bad for her. She's discriminated her own, against. Yeah, go ahead, Helene, what? She is discriminated against. Yeah, because right, exactly. Right, and, and, and she's loved was discriminated against. Yes, absolutely. Ruth, in some translations, she gets a double portion or a most favorite portion. Yes, so, the, yes. The, the verse, yeah, that's a great point. The verse here is translated in this specific way. It's actually to not totally clear what, what it means. Um, is she being favored or is she being discriminated against? But I think, the, the, I think either way, what we can take away from it is that she's being, not being, it's a treatment that reflects the fact that she does not have children, or at least highlights the fact that she does not have children, or at least she perceives it as such. So let's, so let's, let's move forward and see what else comes up. Um, but to Hana, oh wait, sorry, we did that. Okay, moreover, her rival, to make her miserable, would taunt her that the Lord had closed her womb. So now Penina doesn't even have a name. She's just Sarata, right? The, her rival, the one who's giving her Tsaras. Um, and what did she do? She taunts her. Yeah, she taunts her. She says, ha, 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 God closed your room, right? She constantly reminds Hana of the objective reality of her condition in a way that is not nice. And so now we're told this was a recurring, this happened over and over again. This happened year after year. Every time she went up to the house of the Lord, the other would taunt her so that she wept and would not eat. So this treatment has reached the point where what has it done to Hana? made her depressed yeah it's made her depressed yeah absolutely mm -hmm. right she cries mm -hmm. she can't eat she's like totally miserable mm -hmm. and so what might we what 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 might we expect her husband um to say remembering that you know he loves her right so what 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 would be a good reaction to this if he were a modern husband he would sympathize with her Okay. okay, modern husband would sympathize. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and say what? 
I love you despite your not having children. What can I do to help? Should we take other kind of medicine? <laughs> right, totally, exactly, absolutely. Be in touch with her feelings. Think about her from her shoes. But instead, uh, I'd like to know where we find these modern husbands. <laughs> <laughs> um, as Ruthie's father, who's a modern husband as well. Um, no, just uh, one other thing. I just want to add. Her mm -hmm. also not eating, perhaps, is emphasized here and will be raised by Elkin also because she's not eating the sacrifice. Mm. It's not that she's just not eating. Here he went and slaughtered a sacrifice and she's even refusing to participate in that. And I think that's part of like, that's really saying she feels isolated. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that it's a, a flaw in her that she did that or should, should she have eaten it? No, I don't, that's a good question. I, I, haven't, that, I haven't researched that, I don't know. I, I don't know how to take that, but it, it certainly is an in, it's indicative of, I, I would read it this way, in a, in a, I guess a sympathetic way. It's indicative of her pain that she's so distraught mm -hmm. that she can't even get hungry for a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, beautiful, yeah. I think also that it's highlighting the, the difficulty that women without children maybe had in part, part, fully participating in Jewish society. Because when I read the initial part about Elkanan distributing the Korban, it didn't seem to me to actually be discriminatory. It seems that each person got a portion and Penina's, Penina had more people um, and Hannah just had one. But then her not eating it really highlights that it's sort of saying like, the way to fully participate in this is to do so with your children and Hannah is therefore excluded. That like yeah. society is built that way. Right, well, Jewish community is built that yeah, way. Yeah, that's what I meant. Right. This community that we're talking about here. That's, well, and I mean. Yes, and now. And now, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we don't have to sugarcoat it. And now, still a big problem. <laughs> so, um, and El right, and Elkanah has this response that is just, it's just devastating, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so her husband Elkanah said to her, Hana, why are you crying? And why aren't you eating? Why are you so sad? Am I not more devoted to you than 10 sons? So what does Elkanah here reveal perhaps about himself? He, that he thinks he's so powerful that he should be able to make it better for her that she can't have kids. And yeah, he, right. And, if he's such a great husband, why is he giving her less food? He is not such a great husband. He's giving um, the uh, Panina, right? He's giving Panina mm -hmm. more food. I mean, that's so discriminating. Again, yeah. I agree with Liara. I don't think they're getting an unfair share. Okay, but well, but still, but either way. What is what does Panina use that as an option as an opportunity to do? To taunt her more, right? To taunt her more. The reality is that based on Hannah's circumstances, she is treated differently, mm -hmm. which therefore, like, but and the person making those decisions says, "I don't understand what the problem is." Right? Like, I should be enough for you. Why aren't I enough for you? I, I, what he's basically saying is, I don't understand how to step into your shoes, Hannah, to understand what's upsetting you. I'm instead gonna view your experience through the lens of how I would feel if I were you and make the determination based on that, right? I mean, to use like modern parlance, he almost mansplains her feelings to her, right? Says like, I don't understand what's your problem, right? I should be enough for you. Right. Um, instead of saying what's bothering you, right? Um, he can, he's sensitive enough to pick up on, it must be something related to that, but he, he's not actually willing to take the next step of talking to her about it. Um, and Panina, of course, is, um, you know, capitalizing, we, we, we really don't see positive examples of sister wives very often, right? So it shouldn't surprise us that much that she's using this opportunity to, she's taking what she can in order to make Hannah feel bad and to make herself feel better. So how much of a parallel is this to Yaakov and Leah and Rachel? What do you think? I think it's very much one, but I don't remember Yaakov saying these kinds of things to Rachel. And I remember well, he, 
a more sympathetic relationship between Rachel and Leah, although there was tension. Where I see a similarity is that Leah felt the least favorite, but her children compensated. Panina also is not the favorite, but she also feels she has more, you know, she has the children. Totally. And Yaakov's response is different. He says, right, he says like, well, why do you want me to dive in? It's kind of your problem. Like, I've got kids with Leah, right? Like, this is about you, not me, which is in some ways a meaner response. But the point is both are like failing to understand her perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that like that, that for the, for the purpose of appreciating Hana in this story, Hana is someone who sees what other people don't see, which we'll talk about more. And in order to appreciate her uniqueness in that, her, um, in being an individual, I guess we have to appreciate that the people around her, Dafka, don't, right, are failing in those different regards. Um, and then I had asked in the, in the question, what, what type of person do you expect her to be? Um, I think our, let's, let's just move forward on this. Um, and, excuse me. Well, I guess, let's, yeah, maybe let's ask for one minute. Like, what, when you see, if you know only this first chunk of the story, what do you see the trajectory of Hannah's life being? Where do you see her 10 years from now? Like what type of, how do you think about her? Well, I, it, I think it could go either way. She, she could become very bitter or she could become a very empathetic, um, uh, caring person who understands other people's feelings, particularly around the er area of childbirth and korbanot and, and all of that. But it could easily go the other way. Mm -hmm. But either way, her life will be like somewhat defined by that experience. I think it has, uh, in mm -hmm. the context of this story, it seems like it has to be. But. Great, beautiful. Okay, I love that, right? Because you're saying that this will affect her. Either it'll take her more to one extreme, which is to make her just bitter and, you know, marat nefesh, right? Bitter mm -hmm. soul. Yeah. Um, or it will take her to the other way, make her more of an empathetic person. But either way, it's, those are different expressions of how people react to that kind of experience. Great, excellent. Okay, so now let's move to section two. So, and this is, there, there's nothing missing in between. I just broke it up for the ease of studying it in Chagrusa. Um, So after they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Chana rose. The priest Eli was sitting on the seat near the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. In her wretchedness, I don't love that translation, Marat Nefesh, not, right, Nefesh, right? She's bitter soul. Um, she prayed to the Lord, weeping all the while. And she made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if you will look upon the suffering of your maidservant and will remember me and not forget your maidservant, and if you will grant your maidservant a male child, I will dedicate him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor shall ever touch his head. And she kept on praying before the Lord, Ailey watched her mouth. As she kept on praying before the Lord, Ailey watched her mouth. So now Hannah was praying in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice could not be heard. So Ailey thought she was drunk. Ailey said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Sober up. So now the first question I ask here is what role does Ailey play in Hannah's struggle? And that's definitely what I, I want us to, to talk about for a minute. Very unsympathetic. Very unsympathetic, okay. At and first, at this okay. point in the story. Sorry, what'd you say, Belle, and what? At this point in the story. Yeah, great. He's just mean. Mm. Uh-huh. I think, to sort of continue on my theme here, I think that um, Ellie doesn't see, um, like, doesn't recognize this form of prayer. Um, I think like that it contrasts really nicely with Hana not participating in the korban in the sacrifice and then now she's praying so the like because he's a kohen like he recognizes sacrifice and now this is this is something like completely outside of his realm just like we saw before that um Elkanan didn't recognize mm -hmm. Hana's um pain like he didn't understand the, the, that either mm -hmm. Yeah, the poor, the bitter irony that I think that the author is directing towards Ailey is you're supposed to be the representative of God, right? And then you can't see prayer right in front of you. 
And so we can imagine this, like every part of this story comes to further isolate Hannah. She's isolated from her family. She's isolated from her husband. And now the place you, many, I shouldn't say you, place many people turn to in times of crisis is their, you know, spiritual leader, if one can call Ailey that, right? And now he's, he's making the worst possible conclusion that you could, which is that instead of you pouring out your heart, instead you are drunk, right? Um, and and it, it's, terribly hurtful and um, certainly seeks to make him look bad. And so what might you expect Ailey's reaction, I mean, Hannah's reaction to Ailey to be? Like Ailey needed from him, from religion, from her life. I think it's like, it's so um, spelled out kind of what was going on that I, th I think you're right, like the text is kind of highlighting the negative role he played. You know, she was praying in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice could not be heard. So he thought she was drunk. Like it could have been a little bit more vague. It could have been a little bit more sympathetic reading of Ellie and it's not at all. And <clears throat> I would expect her to be, you know, feel angry and sad and alienated from him. And mm -hmm. what she does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reason I'm asking these questions of what would you expect of Hannah, what would you expect of someone in this situation, is to highlight the fact that the reaction she has is not the common reaction. It is, I don't think it's what most of us would expect out of somebody. I think, and I think that we, Dafka, the reason this text is so powerful is because we really respect the reaction that she has. Because now what does she say in section three? And Chana replied, oh no, my Lord, lo Adoni, I am a very unhappy woman. I have drunk no wine or other strong drink, but I've been pouring out my heart to the Lord. Do not take your maidservant for a worthless woman. I have only been speaking all this time out of my great anguish and distress. Then go in peace, said Eli, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She answered, you are most kind to your handmaid. Excuse me. So the woman left and she ate and she was no longer downcast. Early next morning, they bowed low before the Lord and they went back home to Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So what, what do you make of her response to Ailey? Like, yeah, what's your reaction to her response? I think that um, her response is kind of like, I feel like she kind of, she finally got some kind of like, she finally got somebody to realize like what she was feeling a little bit. Cause Ailey, he like quickly like changed his opinion. Like he was like, well, what are you doing here? And then she like explained herself and then he like, he got it. And he mm -hmm. let her explain herself in a way that like, um, Elkanah hadn't done before. So I think okay, right. that like what made her happier. So, so, so Eliza, so what made, so what, so how would you answer the question, number one, what finally alleviates Hannah's pain? Somebody like letting her explain herself and like actually talking about like what she was feeling or just mm -hmm. like talking about herself for a little bit. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Right. It's funny because you would, it, she, she, she doesn't present herself as being angry at Ailey, right? You can imagine totally losing it at him and saying mm -hmm. like, you know, and instead she still manages to keep her composure. She's still speaking to him in a respectful way. And, but instead of exploding, what she hears from him is like, oh, I get it. I get what you're doing. That's great. Like, good for you. Right. And that's enough for her um, to, to, to feel good about that. She well, I think it teaches us that having your feelings validated is huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard to validate someone's feelings. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not hard to do it, but it's hard to hear what someone's saying sometimes and just validate what they're feeling and not try to change it or fix it or anything like that. Just Do you like have any training in that or anything like that? Who, me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I it's um, the, one of the most powerful tools that we all have in our tool bag is to you know, someone's angry, we don't agree with them, but if we validate, or they're sad and we don't agree with it, if we validate it, 
if we don't learn anything at, at Rosh Hashanah, that we can look at the person that we're sitting next to and validate how they're feeling at any given time. Mm -hmm. That's, it's an amazing thing to be able to do. Totally. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nancy, you. were you going to say something? Uh, yeah, actually, much like what Deborah just said, um, it's a big deal to go from being misunderstood in frustration to being understood. And at least Eli, Ellie understood her at that point on some, some minimal level anyway. Yeah, beautiful. I was just going to add that historically, it would have been very inappropriate for a woman, a lowly woman from the provinces to show anger towards the high priest. Mm -hmm. So it would have... Yeah. It would have been highly unusual, even if she'd felt like it, for her to uh, um, to behave in a in a aggressive or disrespectful way. So bear that in, keep that in mind, because we're going to look at a couple of Gemaras. But yeah. So um, so da, 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 da. the last part I didn't. Let's just do quickly. Bear with me. So Hannah conceived, and at the turn of the year, she bore a son. She named him Shmuel, meaning I asked the Lord for him. And when the man Elkanah and all his household were going up to offer to the Lord the annual sacrifice and his votive sacrifice, Hannah did not go up. She said to her husband, when the child is weaned, I will bring him. For when he has appeared before the Lord, he must remain there for good. And her husband Elkanah said to her, okay, do as you think best. Stay home until you have weaned him. May the Lord fulfill his word. So the woman stayed home and nursed her son until she weaned him. So it's like, she has that clarity, right? She sees things, she knows what she wants, she knows what's right, and she doesn't waver, she doesn't, you know, she, she stays on that path directly, which I think is really interesting. And she's willing to articulate that to her husband in a way that at least appears to be very, you know, direct, um, which is, you know, I think also speaks, to, speaks positively to her character. So when she had weaned him, she took him up there along with three bulls, one ephah of flour and a jar of wine. And though the boy was still very young, she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. After slaughtering the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. She said, please, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you and prayed to the Lord. It was this boy I prayed for, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. I in turn hereby lend him to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And they bowed low there before the Lord. Very Lord. Okay. So she brings him in and dedicates him, right? And says, I got what I prayed for. And so he's yours for as long as God, right? As God wants, as well, as long as he lives. Now Hannah prays. Um, and I think it's important to remember that this, we often think of Hannah's prayer as this. It's actually, you know, there's two part. Um, she, Cause she prayed in the beginning. We don't know the words that she said. Um, well, I mean, we know some of the words, but also, but here now she's praying and we know the words of that. Um, that this itself could be an entire sheer. We'll just look through it quickly just to get the, the, the main themes of it. Um, but of course, there's so much more that could be said about it. So in Hana prayed, my heart exalts in the Lord. I have triumphed through the Lord. I gloat over my enemies. I rejoice in your deliverance. There is no one, there's no holy one like the Lord. Truly, there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more with lofty pride. Let no arrogance cross your lips. For the Lord is an all-knowing God. By him, actions are measured. The bows of the mighty are broken and the faltering are girded with strength. Men once sated must hire out for bread. Men once hungry, hunger no more. While the barren woman bears seven, the mother of many is forlorn. The Lord deals death and gives life, casts down into Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He casts down, he also lifts high. He raises the poor from the dust, lifts up the needy from the dunghill setting them with nobles, granting them seats of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, he has set the world upon them. He guards the steps of his faithful, but the wicked perish in the darkness. For not by strength shall man prevail. The foes of the Lord shall be shattered. He will thunder against them in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give power to his king and triumph to his anointed one. Then Elkanah and Hannah went home to Ramah and the boy entered the service of the Lord under the priest Eli. Now, Ailey's sons were scoundrels. They paid no heed to the Lord, <laughs> which I left there because it's important to know that context. Um, okay, so so if you had to just say, what what is, this is a woman who prayed for a son, got a son, is dedicating him to the Lord, and is now going in to pray. What would you expect her prayer to be one of? 
Thank you. Thanksgiving. Thank you. Right? It's, um, it's, uh, yeah, thank you. This is amazing. Wouldn't that round out the story nicely? Mm-hmm. Instead, what would you say is, like, if you had to summarize, you know, her prayer, what's the thesis of her prayer, the main theme? I think it's a lot about her, actually. Not directly, but it's very, very personal to her. Interesting. She Same talks water. about, like, people who are hungry aren't hungry anymore. She talks about, um, yeah, gloating over her enemies, mm-hmm. which um, uh, Pina had been called her, you know, rival, like her enemy. Mm-hmm. And just like it seems very personal to her. It does. And it's very triumphant, right? Yes, absolutely. Great observation. But Anyone I also think yeah. that there is a large element of thanksgiving to God in that because she's extolling his praises. Okay, great. But what is she, what is, so what are the praises of God here? That the hungry are no, the poor are no longer hungry. And you, you've covered up all the text. I can't. Oh, I'm sorry. I know, I know. That's the one downside. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I should have brought my antenna. Um, well, I can also put it in, um, I'll put it in the chat as well. So if anyone wants to open it on their own device, they can do that at the oh. same time. I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. Um, so, okay, well here, let's, let me ask it a different way. Why do we read this for the Haftorah and Rosh Hashanah? I like the power of prayer. Okay, great, the power Rosh of prayer. prayer. Thank you. Which is a big shift, you know, at this time in Judaism, personal, private prayer and, you know, which is indicative of maybe a more personal relationship with God. Um, I think also like kind of, you see the evolution of a person in this, it's just not even a lot of text, but mm-hmm. you see Hannah's evolution and her reaction to adversity. And, um, and yeah, I think there's so many reasons that it's a perfect reading for Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. I think, it, I think it gets everybody's attention, just like the Akedah does. Um, it, it's, there are communities that won't read this on Rosh Hashanah, that, that don't read it. Because of the infertility what? stuff? Yes. Yeah. Because of the what? The infertility, right. So, oh, okay. so and this is something I've spoken about Shul the past two years, is that, um, you know, it's a story that some people who are struggling to conceive find comfort in because, you know, she finally gets her son. It's a story Mm -hmm. that others sort of feel like is a bit of a smack in the face because a lot Mm -hmm. of our stories of infertility in the Torah result in, and then they got their miracle baby, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Which just enjoys the case. And so some people Mm -hmm. really find that like very problematic. Um, So, and, 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 you know, this, if you, if you Google, why do we read Hannah's story on Rosh Hashanah? You'll see probably two answers. One is that it connects to the theme of, you know, God remembering those who, um, who want to conceive, you know, in accordance with Sarah, right, which we read in the Torah reading and all that. And the second is because her prayer really is also about God as king, right, which is one of the major themes of Rosh Hashanah. Now, so I just want to point that out because it's interesting. You, you know, we, like we said, we would expect the prayer, the prayer to essentially be summarized as thank you. And as you noted, there are elements of thanks, absolutely. But there's also more triumphant notes, which I really appreciate, Aliza. Thank you for sharing that you see that as, as you know, a personal sense of triumph. Um, one could also see it as a, a, a more like communal or like meta narrative of like God is king, God is better than everybody else, right? God reigns above all, which certainly is one of the themes of Rosh Hashanah. So it's kind of a, a mishmash of different themes like that. Now, um, and uh, actually, I mean, the story is actually like very complicated because there's just so much going on and so much to pull out. So what we're going to just look at uh, with the the remainder of our time is I wanted to see um, how did the rabbis think about Hannah. Um, this is often you know what what I'm interested in. Now, um, those of you who, who did the Dauphin for for those of this might still be somewhat fresh on your mind. There are a bunch of the Gemara in Brachot like 31a, 31b, a little bit in 32 talks a lot about Hannah. 
um, and derives multiple laws of prayer, Bahana, and analyzes the different lines of her prayer until it goes into a tangent and doesn't really come back as often happens in the Gemara. So now, sex, statement one in the Gemara um, says, Rav um, Hamnuna asks, how many halachas can be derived from the verses and the prayers of Khan? Right, and it's, as it says, and Chana spoke to her heart, only her lips moved and her voice could not be heard. So Eli thought her to be drunk. So the Gemara says, you can learn four halachas from Chana. Um, the one is that one who prays must focus his heart on his prayer. The second is that um, only her lips move. The halacha is that one who prays must enunciate the words with his lips, right? You have to move your mouth. Another one is you cannot raise your voice in the Amidah prayer. You can't shout it. Um, it's supposed to, according to here, it's supposed to be said silently. And then um, the last one is it's forbidden to pray when you're drunk, right? Because Ailey rebuked her for praying when he was drunk, when she was drunk. So based on this Gemara, what role does the story of Hannah play in the eyes of the sages? Don't think about it too much. Like said simply. She's an example. She's an example, right? Look at her. She's literally the example for how to pray, right? That's a pretty good way to go down in history. Helena, are you trying to say something? Yeah, what I like is she, ha I love this. She has a heart for God. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And she yeah. prays with her, with her heart. Yeah, and I think, I think that what the story makes clear is that she is, She's one, one of those unique people who stands out, right? Who is surrounded by people who don't get it, who don't get her, who don't get it, right? And she's the one who consistently gets it. Um, and that makes her unique and that makes her special. And that's absolutely pre preserved in the, and highlighted in this Gemara that says, yeah, here's, look, she's the example of how you pray. Sounds good. And I think that we use this Gemara, you know, to, to praise Hana and to say, you know, this is one of the reasons that she's such a powerful person. The story so powerful. And this is why we read it on, you know, on Rosh Hashanah. Um, there, but there are a couple more um, Gemaras that I think take like a different spin. I don't want to spend um, too much time on them. Um, but just to, to look at them quickly. Now we're going in a different direction. So now statement two, on the subject of Ailey's rebuke of Hana, it is stated, and Ailey said to her, how long will you remain drunk? Remove your wine from yourself. Um, Rabbi Elazar said, from here, the halacha, the one who sees um, in another an unseemly manner, he must reprimand him, is derived. Right, so what Rabbi Elazar says, this, this pasuk teaches you, you see someone doing something that's not good, you should yell at them, tell them they're doing the wrong thing. But now, here we go on, they say something else. And Hannah answered and she said, no, my master, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit and I have drunk neither wine nor liquor, but I pour it my soul before the Lord. Now in the Hebrew, you can see I bolded the Hebrew, right? She said, the pasuk begins with, lo Adoni, right? And she's saying, no, my master, that's not what's happening. But the Gemara is going to understand this differently. So the Gemara is now suggesting, regarding the words, no, my master, lo Adoni, Ula, and some say Rabbi Yossi, son of Rabbi Hanina, said that she said to him in an allusion, with regard to this matter, you are not a master, and the divine spirit does not rest upon you, as you falsely suspect me of this. In other words, what they're, what they're saying is, lo adoni is not a, no, my master, no, 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 it's lo adoni, like, you are not my master on this one. You got it wrong. You couldn't see what I was doing. And so even though you're Ailey, you're the Kohen, right? You're the representative of God. Nope. Divine spirit doesn't rest upon you on this one. I was the right one. So what, do, what are the rabbis doing with this Gemara, with this statement? Now, what are they seeing Hannah's role as? She's not our model just for prayer, but what else? I mean, what is she doing? Pushing back. Pushing back, right? Yeah, she's standing up to power in modern terms. Yeah, standing up to power, right? Calling it out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Helene. Yeah, you can just I unmute yourself and chat. Mm -hmm. Is that she's a strong woman and she pushes back, not in an arrogant, offensive way, but in a direct way, and she's graceful about it. She doesn't, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, such a, it's a quality that one could aspire to, to state your feelings and your, um, your uh, 
beliefs mm -hmm. without being hostile or antagonistic. I, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's good. And, you know, in the original, you can understand her when she says, no, my master are lords, and he, no, 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 no. Either right. she really is, you know, sort of a, a timid person who doesn't want to offend, or she knows exactly what she's doing. But like many women who've come before her and still to this day, she knows how she has to phrase it. And that's in a way that's, you know, flattering to him, self-deprecating to her, right? Establishing the power dynamic so that she can then, you know, sort of start to advance her point. But this Gemara dismisses both of those and says, no, she said straight up to, to his face, you don't know what you're talking about. You're wrong. It's funny, I always thought of the story as really sad because the power structure seemed so detached from her experience. And she just, like, there was just such a disconnect between what was going on for her and what was going on, you know, in Ailey's mind and how he saw the situation. But this Gemara kind of seems, can be seen as somewhat of a corrective right here. The power structure is recognizing not just her experience, but that her experience needed to be validated and they weren't getting it. And the leadership at the time was wrong. Yeah. Yes. I love, yeah. What was crazy to me about that is that in order for her to get that, she literally needs to give her son to Ailey. I mean, to God, but like. <laughs> no, I know. That's the part I know. She makes the ultimate sacrifice. Ultimate. Is it different Maybe than what Avram was prepared to do? You know, probably, yeah. But like literally, Ailey gets to raise her son. Uh -huh. it's not, like it's the same person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But did she need to do that? Exactly, like, she didn't. She need yeah. To? Yeah, that's the part I haven't focused on as much as like what's going on with that part, right? <laughs> um, and also like, does she want to fix it? Um, because uh, what I think I didn't include this part of the uh, Gemara. I didn't include it, but there's also, she, she says, I'm not a bat bliyal, right? I'm not, which is bliyal um, in my Shmuel class we've been talking about. It. It's the standard word used in the text in this, throughout this book to refer to like no gooders, right? People are just up to no good. Um, and then what, how does the story, the part I purposely include the last line, uvne eli bnei bliyal right? They were up to no good. And so one of the suggestions is when she says, I'm not a bat bliyal, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not up to no good. I'm a good person is what she's actually subversively saying is, I'm not like your sons, right? <laughs> your sons are out messing around with women and drinking and doing all sorts of inappropriate things. Like I'm the good one. And in that case, if you, you know, want to think of it like that, then what is she doing by dedicating Shmuel to that service? she's sacrificing her son to fix the integrity of God, right, essentially, and the system, right? By displacing Chafni and Pinchas, she, and with Shmuel, she's giving her son in order to restore the dignity of God's Kohanim, which is a sacrifice. But, you know, if you're thinking about this as a book that's telling the narrative of God's people, that's like a pretty powerful thing to say about someone. Jivanka, yes. I was uh, wanting to just give my thoughts on, I don't recall who asked, well, did she have to give her son up? It mm -hmm. came to me that she took a lay of the land of where she lived, who her son would have to grow up around. And if the hand that rocks the cradle tormented her, what, what could she expect as far as an environment mm. for her only son. Mm. And it was a way of preserving him, mm. my thoughts. That's a beautiful point, thank you. That's a really, really good point. Beautiful, thank you. Um, Helene, last point then. Well, yeah, it reminds me, she, she says what she means, she means what she says, but she doesn't say it mean. Mm -hmm. Yes, right, she's direct but not mean. Yeah, absolutely. She's able to walk that very fine line. By the way, when I'm calling on people, it's because they're the first four I can see on my screen. It does not mean I'm not calling anyone else. So raising your hand is not a good way for me to notice you. So just unmute yourself and call out, please. Everyone, we're just popcorning it here. Can I um, just okay, ask so something? One quick thing? Yeah, Dad. Yeah, go ahead. And it also is st striking. She makes the decision about her son, not Elkanah. He's out of the picture. Yeah. And that's part of the, I mean, that's part of that, what people are saying. It's that powerful aspect of Tana, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. This is her, this isn't Elkanah's son. Mm -hmm. This is her son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's in contrast, contrast that to Manoach, right? Um, Shaul's father, who, you know, God keeps appearing to Isha Manoach and Manoach is like, oh, great. Like, I'll take over. And God's like, nope, <laughs> this is not your call. And Manoach's like, great. I'll, yeah. And here, Elton, I was like, all right, cool. Whatever. That's fine. You know, go do your thing. I don't care. Um, okay. So for the sake of... I'm sorry. I know you want to move no, on. No, go ahead. Go I ahead. Have a slightly different take on her leaving her son with Eli, mm -hmm. um, since his sons were scoundrels, she was taking a very big risk letting her son be raised in the same environment that, that um, they were. And that's a little, it's the flip side, like she, it may not have been good for them to be raised where, uh, with Elkanah and with um, Penina around, but it's also risky to turn them over to. Yeah, to yeah. Turn and I think the text is clear to convey that Ailey is, is cl clearly, it's based on the, the bigger picture of the text, that Ailey is a good guy who clearly didn't see what was right in front of him. And actually in a minute, we're gonna bop over to the version that has my notes because I can't look at my notes while I'm doing this because it's screen share. So um, just because I, I had notes about specifically the scene that I just don't remember each piece off the top of my head. So source three- um, can... Hannah does have three more sons than I think two more daughters. Mm -hmm. So I think it doesn't make up for sacrificing Samuel right. in, if you want to call it a sacrifice. Right. right, beautiful, yeah. So source three, you can look at on your own. Um, that's just uh, another example of the way the rabbi saw her interjecting herself um, in a good way. Let's just now look at statement four, and then um, and then we'll 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 summarize and close out. So um, now I'm actually going to. Where is this my no wrong one? No, here we go. Okay, now we're gonna bop over to my version that has my notes. First of all, now we're gonna talk about seeing a little bit. The role that seeing plays in the story thus far. First of all, Elkanah comes from Sophim. What does Sophim mean? See, right? Ironic, because it's Dafka Elkanah is someone who doesn't see. Now, what, what, what the Gemara we're going to look at is going to look specifically at this pasuk here where I made my comment. Um, when Hannah takes her vow and uh, she's going to dedicate her son, she sa it says, um, he, she says, Hashem tzvakot im ra'ot eh. If you will look upon the suffering of your maidservant, right? If you will really see me. Now, the first implication is no one else sees her, which is very true, right? And, and tragic. Um, Ailey looks at her and says, oh, her mouth is moving. But of course, he doesn't actually see, because if he saw, he would understand what was going on. So um, now we look, let's look at this last Gemara. Oopsa, oopsa, oopsa. Um, okay, here we go. She says, um, so commenting on Imra Otir F. So Rabbi El Azar said, Chana said before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the universe, if you will look upon Ra'o, me now, fine. And if not, in any case, you will see. So here what the Gemara is saying is im ra'otir eh is not double language of God, like if you will really see me, it's actually im ra'o, if you will see, good. And if not, tir eh, you will see, like I will make you see. Now, so the Gemara, so now we have the explanation. Okay, what was Khana threatening? She said, I will go and seclude myself with another man before Elkanah, my husband. Since I secluded myself, they will force me to drink the sota water to determine whether or not I've committed adultery. I will be found innocent because she knows she won't have committed adultery. And since you will not make your Torah false, I will bear children." Right, so what are we talking about? For the Sota ritual, if a woman is secluded with a man who is not her husband and her husband can accuse her of this, they go, she, Kohen takes her, she drinks the water, right, and the whole thing, and if she's guilty, her stomach explodes or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And if not, she goes back to her husband, and she conceives as if that fixes it. But anyway, that's another conversation. Um, and so now what she's saying is, what was she threatening? She was saying, God, if you see me, you'll give me a kid. And if not, 
I'm going to make you see. And what am I going to do? I'm going to go seclude myself with another man. I'm not going to sleep with him, but I'll seclude myself enough to get me accused of being a Sota. I will be found innocent. And then if a woman is found innocent, she gets to conceive. And that's how I'm going to have children. Wow. Um, because, and that's what the Torah says, right? That's the outcome. So according to this Gemara, what was Hannah telling, threatening God that she was going to do? Like, right, like using the Sota. So what is she saying here? I don't know. Give me your reactions. I'm not asking one specific thing, but like, what di what's the dynamic here? What are we saying about Hannah here? Da, 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 da. Throw it at me. This doesn't, this doesn't really answer your question, but my, um, my reaction to this was that she like, she really knew, um, you know, the laws, the way that society worked. Mm -hmm. I think she was really like, um, I think she knew that a lot of times it was very against her, mm -hmm. but she knew that and she knew how it did work. She was yeah, going to make it work for her. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. She knew she was going to find that loophole or not loophole, but she knew the system well enough to know the one way that she was going to make it work. Right. She was someone who was smart enough and, and calculated enough to be able to look and to see what do I need to do in order to make this happen. And I was struck by the language that she used of seeing. Did anyone, was there like one more comment or something like that? Well, I, I always think of the Soto ritual as something to appease the husband. Mm -hmm. um, because you kind of know you're not, you're not going to blow up from drinking. Yeah. So she knew that and it was a way to bring them in and onto her side and to, you know, being sort of in control for lack of better words. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think it also gives a little, um, a little context for why her second tefillah is so triumphant. Like obviously some of it is because the tables have been turned, but some of it in this context is basically saying like, because she played the game, like she knew it's not like, it's not just that God gave her a son, but that she managed to arrange it so that she could have mm -hmm. one. Yes, absolutely. So thank you. So I'm aware that, uh, that we're, we're, we're running out of time. So what I wanted to do now, I'm not a big fan uh, of using religious texts for the purpose of seeing today, of, of using them to map exactly onto current circumstances. But what I think that religious texts serve to do in these types of situations, I'm going back to the John Lewis part of it now, is to say that the more, first of all, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But also to see, to try to study and see like what tactics, what dynamics were present here? Why do we like this story and how does it, what can we take from that? Or how can we use that to sort of like understand our current circumstances rather than say, oh, these things are exactly the same, right? What do they have in common? So. When folks were saying, you know, we would, if we think we really like to do something as a community to remember John Lewis, at first, my mind immediately went to Hannah. I don't know why. It was just like, I was like, yeah, that's the connection. Um, and, and I've been, um, you know, reading his, uh, the, his memoir. I don't know if anyone here has read it. It is 500 pages and it's, it's really excellent and it's very easy read. I mean, easy to, it's fast read. No, I'm going to say easy read. So what he discusses is very painful. Um, and, and I'm sure there are people here who, who know more than I do when there's so much to say, but I just wanted to offer just a you know, couple of thoughts on how we can understand Tzvila Khana, especially in the year 2020, um, and connect it to sort of some of the, the things that have been going on in our world this year. He is someone, so he talks about, of course, he was born um, into a family of sharecroppers and was clearly just different. Um, preached to his chickens when he was in charge of taking care of the chickens. And he talks about how he would, you know, while they were picking cotton, which is horribly backbreaking and awful labor, that he would kvetch about it so much that his brother said, just leave. Like, we'd rather do more work and not have you here with us. Um, someone who really, from the moment he was born, just saw the world differently and saw things in the world that everyone else around him um, didn't see. And I thought it was very powerful because he actually uses that language. I'm just gonna read a paragraph from his book. Um, and it specifically talks about seeing, which I thought was really powerful because as we've, as we've seen, the, the theme of seeing and Hannah being someone who sees and makes other people see is certainly powerful in 
um, in her story. So he says by the, um, by the end of the year, and it's a year when, he, when Emmett Till was killed, and he's a young teenager at this point, um, John Lewis. Um, he says, I was chewing myself up with questions and frustration, and yes, anger. Anger, not at white people in particular, but at the system that encouraged and allowed this kind of hatred and inhumanity to exist. I couldn't accept the way things were. I just couldn't. I love my parents mightily, because his parents would say, like, stop talking, right? Stop worrying about it. This isn't your problem. This isn't something we can fix. Keep your head down, work hard, and just trust in God. So he says, I love my parents mightily, but I could not live the way they did, taking the world as it was presented to them and doing the best they could with it. In a lot of ways, I saw them as far stronger than I would ever be. It's simple to criticize people of another time for not acting as we would today. It's easy to judge the past looking through the filter of the present. But that is a mistake. No one can truly know what it was like to be faced with the challenges and realities of a certain time and place unless he or she has actually lived through it. There was no weakness in the way my parents and others of their generation shouldered the burden of their time and made the best of it. Fighting back was hardly an, op an option for them. Fighting back against whom? With what? My parents and millions of other Black men and women just like them bore their load through an age of unbelievable oppression with a grace and a dignity I could only hope to come close to. Theirs was not a time nor a place for turning and facing the system. But as it began to come of age in the mid-50s, the landscape had begun to shift. The time had come. I could feel it. I could see it. I saw it up north in the rulings that were coming down from the courts. I saw it at home in the south where the lines of white backlash and violence are being drawn in response to those rulings. And in December of that landmark year, 1955, I saw just up the highway where Dr. King took the words I'd heard him preach over the radio and put them into an action in a way that set the course of my life from that point on. So what he, I think that you know a, a lot of the thesis of his childhood is that he grew up with people he loves and admires and respects enormously, and just fundamentally he saw the world differently than them, and he sees the room for potential, um, and that and, and he just he sees that things can be different, and that's what motivates him to get involved in all of his um, activist work with the Freedom Riders, um, etc. And in, in the early 1960s. Now about one page later, I almost died when I read this because I read. I knew I wanted to have this um, share. He says that the first sermon he ever gave, he was 15 years old and he, it was called A Mother's Prayer and it was on the first chapter of the Book of Shmuel. And apparently there was a photographer there and they took a picture and it got written up in the local news. I tried Googling every combination of it that I could. I couldn't find anything. So I have no idea if this still even exists. But yes, this is Dafka, the chapter that he gave his first sermon ever on at age 15. So I also first just wanted to put that out there that that's really special. That for someone like him, there was something in her story that he really, I think I would guess identified with or at least understood and probably gave a brilliant analysis of. Um, and so that's the first point. The other point is that um, you know, certainly he was a, an amazing person. There's no way for me to do justice to that. And I want to respect people's time. And, and by 915, when we said we would. Um, but that the types of people who make really effective change, I think, are the people who see what other people don't see and understand how to try to work to make things happen. Um, and to bring and to make that world that they live in more just. And I think you see that with Hana. And even that the way that the rabbis imagine her, that she called things out directly. Right. She said she was willing to tell Ailey, you have no idea what you're talking about. She was willing to say to God, if you don't give me a son, I'm going to use the system that you've made in order to get what I want. And of course, we know she doesn't mean that in a demanding, selfish way. She means that in a way that she's achieving justice. And I think that those are the types of traits that you see in the types of people who fight in these types of causes are true change makers and not only change makers but willing to make enormous personal sacrifices the the conviction that you need in order to put yourself in the line of fire literally as lewis did um the, or hana in saying i will give up my son right i will not even have the thing that i want is extreme and truly, you know, stands out. And I think, you know, we know is, is the, the 1% um, of, of humanity, um, whereas the rest of the 99% of us would find those excuses not to go. Um, that's my like, nice, up, like uplifting or serious positive take. I also think that this is a year that's, that necessitates in order to really have these conversations, um, an element of, of criticism or a critical lens as well. So the last thing I wanted to say 
is that I read um, an essay by um, Dr. Leila Bronner, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. It's sort of a feminist critique of Hannah. And what she says is, you have this story, you have this Gemara and Brachot where the rabbis say, look at Hannah, she teaches us how to pray. And yet, what Dr. Bronner says is, it wasn't enough for the rabbis to say, hmm, a woman teaches us how to pray. Maybe she should count in a minion, <laughs> right? Um, maybe she should actually be able to be a part of fully yeah. that community yeah. that she is setting the example for. And I think that we, what, you know, so what my, my like less than cheery um, message for tonight is, and that I really do think is the responsibility, especially as, as a white person of, of, you know, of me to try to give in, in a sheer like this is to say also that when thinking about John Lewis and other activists who fought for amazing causes, we appropriately revere them, which, you know, very important, right? And we take their stories and we cherish them and we teach our children about them and, and we name monuments and schools and all these things after them, which we should. But I think we also, um, using Dr. Bronner's critique to, critique to apply here, have to make sure, um, they have to know that that's not the end of the story. Right? The end of the story is not just saying, wow, look at this great person and what they did. It's also making sure that we actually take that message and actually fold it into their, our own lives. Right? We're not just consumers of their story. We also, if we are going to consume that story, it has to go just beyond the level of consumerism and actually integration into our own societies. I think this year, really, especially we've seen, um, you know, one of the, the lessons is that we thought we did a good job of that and we really didn't. Um, and in fact, I was just today listening to, you know, the New York Times Daily, um, their podcast episode yesterday was on Daniel Prude, who was um, the man who was killed in Rochester by the police back in, in March, um, the mentally um, ill man who, I don't know if you saw the story, you can listen to the podcast. But one of the things I thought was so interesting is that the police found him um, naked in the snow, clearly unwell, um, and then suffocated him um, by putting a mask on him, et cetera. Um, but one of the, his brother had called the police saying, my brother ran away from my home. Joe Prude, Prude had called the police and said, my brother ran away from home. I'm worried, like, has anyone seen him? Um, and they interview Joe um, in this podcast. And he says, you know, I can't believe I, I called, you know, the, the resource that was supposed to help me. And instead he ended up dead. But that's not, I'm not here to, to talk about that. What, what the last thing that he said that was really powerful for me, he said, like, I thought it was 2020, but I feel like a black man in 1960. And that's exactly the year, um, the years that, that John Lewis was actually doing his activist work. And I thought it was very powerful to, especially on the eve of this conversation, to hear that exact quote being articulated, um, which is to say that, how many years is that? 60 years later, right? Um, the wonderful, incredible activism that we saw um, has not uh, fully reached its full potential yet. And so just like this, I think that's part of the lesson of the, of the story of Hana is that it takes a very special person to be able to enter a system, um, critique a system, fight for justice in that system without destroying that system, right? Or, or I mean, without, without tearing it you know, like without being a negative presence, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, but that that has to, we have to make sure that when we, you know, I think one of the messages of, for me now, this year, moving forward of hearing Tzvila Khana is remembering I'm not just a bystander in that. I'm, I'm not just listening to that. I also have to think about, okay, who are the people in my life who I see doing that? And how do I make sure that I'm actually really taking those lessons to heart and, and, and working to actually, you know, do my part um, to integrate those into society. So that is my closing message um, for this. And I really thank all of you so much for coming, for your patience with the technology um, oh. and, and for, for your conversation. It's really been wonderful. So thank you. Thank and you, you can just so pop much. off. I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone wants to chat or whatever. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. It was terrific. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, have a great night. I do want to chat and I don't care whether it's in public or <laughs> Uh, just between the two of us, um, in a similar vein, um, I had put up a Black Lives Matter sign on my lawn mm -hmm. because it was a message I wanted to convey, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. and I've just been reading in the last couple of days about how there's a whole organized movement